Welcome everyone. My name is Sarah and I'm thrilled to be hosting another installment of our Art Escapes program. The topic of this lecture is Japan's earliest ceramics and we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Laura Allen who will be answering questions at the end of our virtual tour. You may be familiar with the cadence of the program by now, but while we have more people join and settle in, we would like to use this time to give a quick overview of the flow of the program and highlight the things that are exciting us at the museum. We're going to have a greeting, um, you could count this as part of the greeting, and an introduction of Laura, followed by the video tour. After the tour, um, I'll be asking Laura questions that you guys have been submitting into the Q&A box. And before we get our program officially started, we would like to acknowledge that the land on which we are gathered is the ancestral home of the Ohlone peoples who stewarded this land for generations. We pay respect to the elders, past, present, and emerging, for they hold the memories, traditions, and culture of their people across the nation. We extend our respect to the Ohlone, Ramaytush, the coastal Miwok, as well as other indigenous people who are present. And if you've attended our previous Art Escapes programs, you might already be a pro. Uh, the chat feature allows you to make comments throughout the program, and the Q&A feature is what we will have you use to submit your questions. And we just want to give everyone a reminder that when you think of questions, you can drop them into the Q&A portion, but please try and make sure not to drop them into the chat portion because otherwise I might not be, uh, be able to see them. So we'll remind you just in case, but if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A as we're watching the video. And again, uh, you don't have to wait till the very end. You can uh, put them in the Q&A as you're so inspired. And let's do a quick practice. Uh, please respond in the chat too. If you could learn one new personal or professional skill, what would it be? And it can be anything that comes to mind. And when I thought of this question, I imagined that you would kind of be able to instantly have this skill without needing to practice. So don't feel like you ha would have to put hours and hours into learning guitar, or bass, or roller skating or anything like that. And it looks like we're getting a few people putting answers into the chat. Oh, someone would like to be an Asian Art Museum docent. Um, well, contact Paula about that. We're always looking for more wonderful people to be a part of our museum family. Oh, playing the guitar, that would be wonderful. I've tried to play the guitar and my I gave up really quickly because my hands got, it hurt my hands. Oh, I'm seeing a lot of languages. That would absolutely be wonderful. Oh, so, someone said speaking fluent Japanese. Um, I was gonna go to Japan um, recently and I tried to learn Japanese and that's something that I would also love to do. Yeah, we're getting a lot of really amazing things. You guys are really inspiring. I need to pick up um, a few new hobbies. Okay. And the museum is now open. I'm not sure if you guys know that. We just want to remind you that um, we, while we're having our virtual programming, you still can come and visit us. Uh, we're open Thursday from 1 p.m. until 8 p.m. So we can catch that late night crowd. Um, Friday through Monday, we're open from 10 a.m. until 5 p.m. And time tickets are available on the website. Uh, there's free general admission the first Sunday of every month. So that's definitely coming up. So if you guys have the chance to visit the museum, we definitely recommend it. And if you're wondering what's new at the museum, here's a peek of just the few newest exhibits on view. I definitely like to give a quick shout out to membership because becoming a member of the museum has fantastic benefits, including um, unlimited free admission, which includes tickets to special exhibitions, invitations to members only previews and events, access to the virtual member lounge, discounts at the museum boutique, and a subscription to our member magazine and weekly e-news. 
there's definitely so much to look forward to at the museum, both in person and online with our virtual events like this. Um, so I encourage everyone to check out our website for the most up-to-date information about some of our exhibitions, uh, the public programs that we have going on, and a full list of the benefits of becoming a member. And so now I've talked a lot about the museum, so I think it's time for me to introduce myself a little bit more. I'm the supervisor of guest experience and group sales. Um, I, you might find me uh, handling ticket sales, coordinating with the um, volunteer and docent lead with for information desk and the concierge station. Um, I assist with private tours and group visits. And we are all about accessibility at the museum. So you'll see me trying to implement more DEAI resources as well as just general accessibility resources as we coordinate with the different departments. And um, yeah, so that's me. And now I have the opportunity of introducing Dr. Laura Allen. She's the chief curator and curator, oh, my slide, of uh, Japanese art. Um, Laura holds art history degrees and she, from the <clears throat> Oberloin College, the Institute of Fine Arts, uh, NYU, and the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, she has published works, includes uh, the studies of Japanese narrative paintings. Um, I might need your help with this pronunciation, Laura, but uh, Uki, Ukiyoe, Modern Prints and Artistic Exchanges Between Japan and the West. Since joining the Asian Art Museum in 2012, she has overseen an ambitious program of Japanese art exhibitions, including In the Moment, Japanese art from the Larry Ellison Collection, Tatsuya Ishida, Saving the World from a Brush, Saving the World with a Brushstroke, The Printer's Eye, Ukiyo Yi from the Grab Horn Collection, Seduction, Japan's Floating World, the John C. Weber Collection, Looking East, How Japan Inspired Monet, Van Gogh, and Other Western Artists, When Pictures Speak, The Written Word in Japanese Art, and Tattoos in Japanese Prints. Current projects include planning for exhibitions of work by contemporary artist uh, Murakami, which we're very excited about, and research on important pair of 17th century festival screens in the Asian Art Museum Collection. And Laura, we're so happy to have you with us and we're very excited. If you'd like, we can introduce the video before we get a chance to play it. Okay, thank you, Sarah, for that kind introduction. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us today for spending your Saturday afternoon with us. It's wonderful and, and I'm so impressed with the number of people here, it's, it's really great. I'm very honored to be here and I hope you enjoy the video and can stay for the Q&A at the end. But first I want to take a moment to thank my colleagues, the wonderful creative team that made this event possible. The concept for this series came from Zach Rose, our Associate Director of Communications. And Zach's idea to produce this series of virtual tours challenged all of us curators, not only to get in front of the camera, but to spend time on our core collections, not necessarily the stars of the collection or the special exhibitions, but less frequented galleries like the one I'll be talking about today. As for the video, Steve Kay filmed the tour and then tirelessly edited the video with, in with input from Niren Nguyen, our creative media producer. And I also wanna thank Sarah Lidwell and behind the scenes, Nicole Smith for hosting the event today and helping with Q&A as well as giving a shout out to our great AV team and their technical support. Last but not least, a personal special thanks to Mia Kodani who made the beautiful Kasuri mask that I'll be wearing during the tour. So without further ado, let's get started.
Hi, I'm Laura Allen, Chief Curator and Curator of Japanese Art at the Asian Art Museum. Today, I'd like to give you a tour of some of the oldest works in the museum's Japanese art collection. Right now, we're in the Early Japan Gallery. It showcases prehistoric objects from Japan's remote past. They are arranged in roughly chronological order and span quite a long time period, from the third millennium BCE to the sixth century CE. The works shown here come from a time well before the first written records. Most of what we know about these objects comes from careful archeological excavations carried out over the last century. New discoveries are happening all the time, adding depth to our picture of the past. The materials found in this gallery are primarily clay and bronze, which being durable, survive when textiles and wood have deteriorated. In particular, I'd like to focus on three early ceramic jars. Clay was used to make vessels in Japan as early as 14,500 BCE. The earliest pottery from Japan is considered the earliest in the world, and they're also an ancient link in a ceramic tradition that continues to the present day. Ever since the first hunter-gatherers, people have needed to store and serve food or to keep other important materials safe. But honestly, you might say, how interesting can a jar really be? What stories can they tell about the past? What can they tell us about social change and the movement of people and ideas? And what do their physical differences reveal about advances in technology? Let's take a closer look. The jar we're looking at right now is estimated to date between 3000 and 2000 BCE during Japan's Neolithic period. It was built up from coils of soft clay without the aid of a potter's wheel. If we could look inside, we'd see that the walls are relatively thick. Clay was mixed with other materials, such as crushed shells. And if you look very closely at the rim, you can see some of those shells. The color and the relatively rough surface tell us that it was fired at a low temperature, probably in some kind of pit fire, like a big bonfire. The low firing temperature means that it's water permeable, so it's a place to store foods rather than keeping liquids. And you've probably noticed by now it's unglazed, but it's still pretty fancy. Someone really cared about its looks and took a lot of trouble to adorn it. There's a variety of three-dimensional ornamentation here. Loop handles with a hole in the top of each handle. They rise in sculptural curls from the top of the rim and the shape of the jar with its columnar body and the swelling area below the rim is actually kind of top-heavy. Maybe ropes went through the loops, helping to keep the jar upright or suspend it. I don't really know that for sure, but it seems to make sense. The entire surface is covered with an intricate surface pattern of curving lines and stippling. It actually combines three distinct decorative techniques. First, you can see applique, thin ropes of clay attached to the surface, incised lines that are scraped into the surface with a piece of wood, bamboo, or shell. And the pattern of dots are actually markings from pieces of rope that have been pressed and rolled into the clay. In Japanese, the word jomon, or cord marked, gives the name to the culture of this period. And there's a surprising variety to these patterns. Archaeologists have studied them, finding twisted, plated, knotted ropes in dozens of distinctive patterns. The care that went into their adornment is one clue that they may have been used for ritual or ceremonial purposes. Excavations have unearthed small figurines from the same period, called dogu, of which we have some fragmentary examples. They're also made of clay. They've been found in circumstances in rituals, and these objects give a picture of a society that was relatively settled, where clay was used not only for practical purposes, to contain food and other materials, but also for ceremonial objects, which were invested with qualities suitable for communicating with spirits. Ceramic forms became more varied in late Jomon, including more complex, decorated forms like this one, which was probably used as a sensor. Openings in the top were to let out smoke or other fragrance. 
Before we leave this jar, let me show you one more interesting thing. If you look really, really carefully, you can see some differences in color, and those indicate that it has been reconstructed in modern times from a collection of small fragments. This is really common for objects this old. It's amazing anything has survived at all. I hope the next time you come to the museum, you can take a closer look. Jumping forward in time, let's move to this case. It holds ceramics from the Yayoi period, 300 BCE to 250 CE. You'll immediately notice that the aesthetic has changed. How about this beautiful shape? It has smoothly swelling sides, a narrow mouth that flares to a trumpet-like opening, and it's very functional, good for keeping grains safe from rodents and moisture. It's a nice, stable, solid form. And it's such a pleasing shape with qualities that remind us of nature's bounty, a body like a pear, a neck like an open flower. The physical differences between this jar and the one we looked at before highlight an important change in Japanese society. Between 1000 BCE and the first century CE, rice cultivation was introduced from the continent, along with ironworking and bronze casting technologies brought by immigrants. Populations became more settled as lifestyle shifted from being based on food gathering to an economy based on food production centering on rice. And there is, at the same time, less variety in ceramic forms, as shapes were made to suit the needs of an agricultural society. There were also some technical changes that subtly affect the appearance of these ceramics. Yayoi ceramics are still unglazed, but now the clay is finer and the surfaces are smooth. The jars are still crafted by hand from coils or slabs of clay, but the walls are getting thinner and they're fired at a somewhat higher temperature, making them more durable and somewhat lighter in color. Archaeologists believe that during the latter part of the Ayoi period, turntables were introduced. It's not yet a true potter's wheel. Instead, as the potter worked, the jar would be placed on a turntable and its surface was paddled smooth from the exterior. This process compacts the clay and results in a regular, symmetrical form. In contrast to the Jomon jar, which was adorned with three distinct types of decoration, the ornamentation here is minimal, and the emphasis is on the form itself. Slight variations in coloring, this dark patch here, for instance, are accidental, not deliberate. The sole decoration is on the neck. You have to look really close to see it. There's a delicate sawtooth pattern incised there. This detail connects this jar to another Yayoi period object nearby in the gallery. This is a bell-shaped bronze, or dotaku, one of the great treasures of our collection. It stands more than two feet high. Though it's shaped like a bell, and its form was derived from bells made in Korea and China, the dotaku has no clapper, and its walls are too thin to sustain their use as instruments. Somewhat mysteriously, they're found buried in remote places in mountainsides. Often, as was the case for this dotaku, they were stacked one within another and then buried. Scholars theorize that the dotaku played a role in the ceremonial life of the Yayoi people and that they were used during rituals to ensure good harvests or other ceremonies connected to agricultural life. If you look closely at the handle, along the edge of the handle, you'll see a sawtooth pattern almost identical to the one on the Yayoi jar. As with ceramics, decoration of the dotaku is usually confined to orderly, symmetrical arrangements of geometric designs. The jar and the dotaku share a common aesthetic, far less exuberant and more controlled than the ceramics produced in the mid to late Jomon period. The third jar in our tour is completely different. It's actually five jars in one. This one is from the period known as Kofun, which translates as ancient burial mound or tumulus. The main body of the jar is a pretty sphere raised on a flaring pedestal with geometric cutouts. 
The cutouts are not just decoration. They were made to promote even heat distribution during the firing process, preventing breakage or distortion. The jar has a neck shaped like a trumpet's horn, and a flat area at the rim indicates that there was once a lid. Other examples that preserve the lid show that our jar's lost lid was probably a flattened dome with a central knob. On the jar's shoulder are perched four miniature jars, and between them, four diminutive animal heads poke out, possibly deer. The color is also quite different than what we've seen before. It's dark gray instead of red. This new type of ware, known in Japanese as sue ware, reflects the introduction of two new technological advancements. First, the potter's wheel. This complicated form was assembled from multiple shapes, most of them formed using a potter's wheel. The dark color has to do with the temperature at which it was fired and the conditions in the kiln during firing. Some of you might be familiar with the term stoneware. This is an early example. It was fired at a much higher temperature than the other two jars, allowing for greater fusion and hardening of the clay body. What made this new type of high-fired pottery possible? It was another new technology, a new type of kiln introduced from the Korean Peninsula in the late 4th to early 5th century. The anagama was made by digging holes in the slope of a hillside. So the fire rises from the bottom of the kiln up the slope and exits through a chimney at the top. The draft in this type of kiln ensures that the fire becomes really hot above 1000 degrees Celsius. And that heat actually fuses and hardens the clay, basically closing its pores and making it more durable. So stoneware represents a real advance in that it can hold liquids. Japan didn't have a culture of using bronze for vessels, although lacquered wood was abundant. By controlling the conditions in the kiln, for example, adding plant materials toward the end of firing, potters were able to take oxygen out of the atmosphere. The smoky atmosphere deposits carbon on the clay, darkening the minerals in the body, sealing its pores, and changing its texture, resulting in a smooth, hard surface of a dark gray or charcoal white color. By the way, this material is similar to the gray pottery used to make roof tiles in Japan, even today. One more thing, looking closely at the side, you can see traces of natural ash glaze. In this high temperature atmosphere inside the Anagama kiln, wood ash from the fire melts, pulled up in the fire's draft, the ash lands on the surface of the vessel and will fuse, forming a glassy greenish surface. Here you see rivulets going down the side. Here it's an accidental effect but later potters make deliberate use of ash to create glazes. Both the shape and the firing method used bear a close relationship to Korean prototypes. For example, gray stoneware from Three Kingdoms, Korea, like this jar on view now in our Korean art galleries. This kind of relatively ornate, elaborate shape would have been reserved for the elite. In a case nearby are other kinds of objects found in tombs of this period such as bronze mirrors and weapons, many of them imported from China, that functioned as symbols of political authority. The best known tombs of this age were enormous keyhole-shaped tombs found from the third century on. The tombs were topped with another kind of ceramic object, figures, animals, houses, cylinders, and ceremonial objects like shields, some several feet tall, known as haniwa. The haniwar are low-fired and made of clay rings like the earliest pottery. These fascinating figures are detailed to reflect a range of individuals in different social roles and statuses, from humble farmers to shamanesses to warriors and rulers themselves. We don't have time to look closely at them today, but I hope you'll come back to the museum sometime soon and spend more time in this gallery. Of course, the Asian Art Museum also has a large collection of Japanese ceramics, not only these early wares, but many amazing later vessels and spectacular sculptural ceramics by contemporary clay artists.
The next time you take a sip of tea or coffee from a porcelain cup or put flowers in a vase of clay, please pause to remember these ancient traces of the past and their links to the achievements of the present day. Wow, thank you, Laura. That was amazing. I'm so glad that uh, we got to watch that all together. Um, I, I definitely got to watch it before, um, so it was great to be able to see it again. Um, so we have our first questions, and definitely we invite everyone to put your questions into the Q&A portion, and so we will be able to see them and read them. And we have a question. The Haniwa are really fascinating. Can you tell us a little bit more about how they were used? And do they have a relationship to the terracotta warriors from the Qin Dynasty in China? Hi, Sarah, that's a great question. The, the, um, the Haniwa do have a kind of a generic similarity to the great terracotta warriors um, that um, came, came out of Chinese tombs. Um, and have been such a spectacular aspect of Chinese archaeology, archaeological finds in the, you know, past decades. But they're they're really different. For one thing, they're much smaller than the terracotta warriors, which are um, really you know life size. Um, but also the important thing to keep in mind is that they're they they were placed on top of the tomb. So um, the the earliest Honeywell were cylinders, just plain cylinders, uh, and then later kind of symbolic objects like, you know, umbrellas or shields, and they might have been placed in a ring around the top of the tomb. And then later they're, they're placed in kind of assemblies, um, groups of figures starting in the fifth, sixth century. Um, and uh, they, you know, they were, um, they've been found on the tops of tombs, but in the absence of written records, there's not that much to tell us about how they were used. So archaeologists tend to study the formations, you know, the way their their placement and the relationship between different types of figures. You know, a a, a figure that looks like a ruler as opposed to a warrior. Um, but there, the findings are really even today not conclusive. There are multiple theories about. Um, you know, the uh, investiture of a new ruler um, being symbolized in their, these arrangements, um, but we don't have kind of hard and fast answers for that. They are very fascinating though. And would you say, um, I know you said that we, we kind of don't know and we have to do some, make some the theories and assumptions about what they symbolize and what they meant. Would the we saw a like a common farmer statue and would that ever be placed on top of a grave or were they more found uh, among like warriors or people who might have been considered of a higher status among the cultures? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, it seems like figures of different social statuses are arranged together on the tomb. Of a, of a ruler, you know, they, a lot of energy and effort was went into building these tomb mounds, which are sometimes quite extensive, you know, covering many acres. Um, so I, you know, the theory is that they, they are the tombs of rulers. So um, ordinary people like a farmer, you know, wouldn't necessarily have a, have a tomb mound with Haniwa on top of it. Um, uh, but uh, you know, it's it's really an intriguing question, and I don't think we have kind of definitive answers about it. Usually arranged in groups, though, of different types of figures, including chickens and houses and all sorts of you know everyday objects. I'd like to see some of the chicken ones. <laughs> that would be a lot of fun. There are even dogs and oh, how fun! Maybe they were uh, to keep people company to some extent in the afterlife. But that's just my theory. I'll let uh, the professionals <laughs> uh, go into it further. And we have another question. And uh, this sort of speaks to the craft of uh, the objects in general. And this question is, why are some of the vessels lopsided? 
Is it because of age or because of how they were made? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. The, you know, you might be thinking of a coffin jar that's sort of wobbly, you know, lopsided. I think uh, that in the case of something, a piece like that, it was made to be four square, you know, very solid, uh, standing upright, and then there was warping in the kiln. Um, I, you know, it depends on what you're talking about. If they're really early Jomon period, I don't think they were always aiming for things to be perfectly symmetrical. Um, so it, it depends a little bit on what you mean by lopsided, I suppose. Well, you can see in the, uh, you showed an example of the firing that showed sort of the darker quality, um, which wasn't exactly intentional. So yeah, maybe, maybe we just won't ever know, but they're very lovely. And on the sort of the topic of the shape, uh, we have another question. Uh, the shape and decorations of certain jars remind me of baskets. Might there be a connection? Oh, that's intriguing. Um, I've never heard that question raised before, um, but it is certainly possible. I think there's, you know, if there were, there probably were baskets back in the Jomon period but they disappeared, you know, there, we don't have any remains of them. So were there bas was there basket, basket making during that period and, and did it influence pottery making? Um, I, you know, I really can't say, I can't speak to that. And how are the objects placed in the hillside kiln? Was it sealed, do you know? And did the potters have to climb inside of it to retrieve objects or maintain the firing process? Mm -hmm. um, so for during the Kofun period when they had early, early Anagama, um, the, you know, the, there's an opening at the front where the fire is built and there's an opening up at the top, like a chimney. And um, yes, the, the, the potters must have kind of climbed inside the kiln to arrange the objects in a row, kind of going down the hill. Down the hill. Um, it wasn't sealed because you'd have to have a place for the fire, you know, to, um, you know, to be actively burning at the bottom and you have to have a place for it to exit at the top. So no, I don't think that they were sealed during firing. And it's fascinating how these are made and how they develop over time. Um, you mentioned that the Japanese ceramics are some of the earliest in the world. Are these the oldest items in our museum's collection? Well, the, the ceramics that I showed today, the early ones are from the third millennium BCE. Um, so they are not, when I said that, you know, they're the oldest ceramics in the world, they go back as far as 14,500 BC. We don't have those pots in our collection. Um, you know, we don't have those very, very early fragments um, in our collection. There are older pieces in our collection from, um, particularly from China, there are some jade objects. There's a nephrite, um, a hoof shape, shape shaped um, cylinder. Um, that is older, um, you know, goes back uh, another thousand years, I think. And um, the um, and also there are oh, there are also Persian Persian ceramics in the collection that are fourth millennium BCE. So so the the nephrite piece is from you know roughly the fifth century fifth millennium BCE to the end of the third millennium BCE. So that predates the Jomon Jaris that I showed you. And then these Persian ceramics are from the, from the millennium immediately before our Jomon ceramics. And you mentioned that the doka, uh, dotaku um, was from derived from uh, similar bells in China and Korea was do. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm having so much trouble uh, with this particular word. <laughs> was dotaku made with uh, the same Chinese piece mold bronze making technique and similar metal components? Um, I think the technology was very similar. They, 
there were some at the beginning, I think they used uh, stone molds and then later clay molds. And um, the pictures I've seen, at least the diagrams I've seen are usually a two piece mold. And the flange that you see going across the top and down the sides of the dotaku is where those two pieces join together. Um, so I think you know, the techniques are quite similar. The components, um, the you know, bronzes are, are a combination of um, copper, lead, and tin. And interestingly, they found that um, the um, the lead they can do a lead isotope analysis and see that the source of the lead um, is from the mainland and from the Korea, Korean Peninsula. Um, unfortunately, tin and lead they can't. I'm sorry, tin and copper, they can't trace in that way. So we don't really know if they, they were imported materials or whether they also came from the mainland. And but, is that a newer technology that's available or is it something that has been worked on or like what, uh, how does that technology sort of fit into dating? Well, there, you know, it was an existing technology in China before it ever reached, well before it ever reached um, Japan. So I think it, it's believed to have come from Southern China and then through Korea, possibly, um, I don't know that there's a definitive answer about how it, exactly how bronze making reached Japan. But during the Aoi period, by the, you know, the uh, second, third century CE, it reached Japan. It was well developed in China before that. And we saw some discoloration on um, the bell. Part of it was sort of a richer cobalt that we've seen in intentionally placed on uh, ceramic pieces, but some of it was sort of a, in my descriptor, sort of a like a lighter, almost a lime kind of lichen looking green. Mm. Um, does the cobalt indicate that it was painted? And what is the cause of that coloring? Mm, that's a great question. They're really beautiful colors, um, and they, they came out in the in the um, the photos that were used in the video. It's um, so it's always a, an exercise to you know to kind of get your you know your mind to wrap around what one of these pieces would originally have looked like. But it probably was bright and shiny at one time, right? Um, and uh, you know a golden color. Um, you know uh, it's it's mostly copper. And the copper oxidizes over time and it forms a patina, which is actually, um, it, it, it creates this oxidation, creates malachite green and azurite blue, which is also really interesting because those are very uh, materials very commonly used for pigments in Japanese painting. Um, so it's, if you, if you, because the composition, as I understand it, the composition of the metal itself is changing, you can't take the patina off and clean it up. You don't want to do that because you eliminate a lot of the surface details. So, um, you know, if it's just a patina and it's considered chemically stable, you know, we just try to preserve it in that form. There's also, you know, a concern for bronze diseases that um, can also cause a kind of a powdery green or blue, green or blue substance. And that's, a, that's worse, that's a chemical reaction. And um, you know, the chemical alloys kind of um, turn into acid and cause corrosion. So I think that in, in, in displaying bronzes, we generally try to keep them in a very low humidity environment um, to protect them and you know, they're probably, um, other techniques for dealing with that, but you know they are stable, and you don't want to take the patina off. I guess is the bottom line, right? It's kind of um, itself. Yeah, I think it's lovely. <laughs> Maybe not the original uh, intent, but is there any um, risk of that spreading to other objects in the collection if they have that um, acidic quality that I um, assume we don't want? <laughs> on the bronzes, is there a risk of that becoming sort of jumping from one piece to another? Hmm. Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. You know, I would want to ask a conservator about that, um, whether, whether it, you know, like a virus, it can kind of jump from one piece to another. Um, I know that, you know, when it's discovered, they really want to 
you know, be very conscientious, conscientious about treating it so that it doesn't at least spread on the surface of the piece it's bound on. And one of the things that we do, I think, you know, um, the uh, conservation staff is very diligent about going through the galleries and checking the pieces, even when they're, you know, on a permanent display or semi-permanent display to make sure there isn't any further corrosion taking place. It takes a whole team <laughs> just to have for one object on display. Yeah. And um, you mentioned that the, the profund jar was probably thrown on a wheel. Were wheels common or were they more coveted tools? And um, there's this is sort of a two parter. Did the Japanese invent them or did they learn the, uh, the wheel use from other cultures? Yeah, the, uh, the potter's wheel were, wheels were introduced from probably from the Korean peninsula. Um, you know, the resemblance between the Kokon piece that I showed you and, and, and works from Middle Kingdoms, Korea, suggests a, a really direct connection. And um, so, you know, it wasn't a Japanese invention. Um, they existed in the Korean peninsula and were probably brought to Japan by immigrants. Um, and during, because these were wares that were made for the elite and they were so much in demand for tombs, they were often included in tombs as burial objects or ritual objects. They, um, they, they, scholars believe that there was a kind of a professional class of potters at this time and they would um, access to potter's wheel and, you know, special glaze and um, these uh, anagama kilns and um, be able to turn out, you know, numbers of wares for the elite. And do you know if wheels of that time are much different from the construction of modern wheels? I know um, very basic ceramics and very basic sewing. And in my mind, sewing machines used to have the foot pedals and now they're electric. And so is there much difference from a, a wheel from that time period as a wheel that you would see in use today? Um, yeah, I, I, I think there, there are probably some differences. I, I, I imagine that they're not quite like the kick wheels that you, you know, that are still in use in Japan today. It's not all been electri you know, electrified, um, but I don't know the specifics. Yeah, I had a hard. I was doing some looking, you know, for this um, for this talk today, and um, you know, I didn't. I wasn't able to come on a lot of really great resources for um, potter, pottery making, specific pottery making tools like the pot, what the potter's wheel looked like during that period. I think it was probably from the diagrams that I saw. It was pretty basic, you know, a, a turntable and maybe um, attached to some kind of treadle that allowed you to move it around, you know, move it along. But um, I need to do a little more looking on that one. They definitely made it work. Those pieces are beautiful, no matter what they were doing. <laughs> and several viewers have asked about the Homon vases. Are there other museums that have more intact ones? And are they commonly found in Japanese ceramic collections? Mm. Um, commonly found in Japanese ceramic collections. You know, I think that if anyone's going to Japan and is interested in this material, you should make a stop at the Tokyo National Museum. They have a fabulous collection of Jomo and Yayoi and Koku and uh, archaeological material. And, um, you know, the, whether, whether there were, are, are pieces that have been lifted intact from the ground. I don't really know. You know, I think I suspect that in most archaeological sites, the pieces are, you know, shattered in, in multiple pieces, and many of them have been reconstructed. Um, they're very, very ancient, you know, and they made Jomo pottery over the course of 10,000 years, and then there are other, you know, civilizations, basically, societies built on top of them. Um, so often found in fragmentary form, um, but um, I would really strongly encourage people, it's uh, not a part of the Tokyo National Museum that maybe people uh, have been to, um, 
most of all, but um, if you want to see more Joan Ceramics, they have a fantastic collection. And they also have uh, a great selection of uh, Haniwa um, in a kind of a reenactment of what they would have looked like on the tomb mound. So. And are there examples of that pottery with anthropomorphic decorations, uh, like some things that represent animals? Yeah, there is German pottery with animal heads or maybe human heads um, towards the rim. There's a whole style of pottery uh, from the German period that has, um, you know, that have kind of faces built into the rim. Mm -hmm. And do we know if the Haniwa were created by uh, individuals or by a group of particular craftsmen? That's a, that's a great question. Um, again, if, you're, if you imagine the efforts that went into covering an entire tomb mound with you know, a ring of circular Haniwa, uh, you know, columnar haliwa, haniwa, or multiple, you know, uh, varieties of figures. It's an enormous undertaking. Whether they rallied specialist craftsmen who were, you know, specifically assigned to making haniwa, or whether many different people joined into that kind of activity, I don't think is really known today. Um, they don't seem to be individualized, you know, there's, a, you know, there's no sense that um, individual craftsmen kind of put their signature style into the Haniwa. There are regional variations and uh, regional styles, but, um, you know, whether there were specific workshops regionally that were assigned to produce the Haniwa or not, I think is unclear. And you mentioned earlier that the um, there were shells incorporated into the material for the creation of some of these objects. Do you know if that was due to like the structural integrity of the object or did it have to do more with, this is just my assumption, they just had these materials around and were sort of utilizing them in their everyday objects? Um, I don't think we know the answer to that. Um, you know, why they incorporated fresh shells. Um, I, don't, I don't know that we can answer that question. I, I would love to be able to, yeah. I would love to be able to travel back in time and just ask everyone. <laughs> and I wish, I, I wish we could just uh, transport someone here and ask them all these questions. Oh, here's a good one. This one seems interesting. Is there any reason for the keyhole shape in the tombs? Mm. Um, another good question. Well, there was a there was a round area at the top, you know, in later in later Kofun, there's a round area at the top, and that that is the area above the burial chamber. Um, and you know, the projection in the front. Um, you know, there are some theories that that was used as a, a platform, a space for for, you know, enacting various rituals. But again, we don't have any written records to tell us why they chose a keyhole shape. So um, most of this is theory. And um, I have never seen a convincing explanation for the keyhole shape. It's fascinating though, because you, you can't really see it if you're at the ground level with a Kofu. And I went and did a tour of some um, tomb sites in Nara you're not really aware of the shape. And it's one of those things like, you know, the, the um, area, when you get to see the aerial view, suddenly you have a beautiful keyhole shape. Um, so I'm not sure even how, how aware people were that that was the shape at the time. And we have, we've had this question a couple of times. This might be uh, another, we just don't know answer, but is there any evidence whether the artists were male or female? And do you know if culturally um, these artists would be male or female, maybe? Yeah, there, for, for a very long time, um, the Jomon potters, the ones who made these exuberant, you know, very sculptural forms, were thought to be female potters. But 
there doesn't seem to be any evidence to prove that one way or the other. And people recent, more recently have just seemed to abandon, have abandoned that particular theory. You don't see it, it's not so common anymore. And I don't even know why they thought women were making them as opposed to men. Um, and again, you know, it's, it's one of the uh, questions that's very extremely difficult to answer. I think that in general, you know, prehistoric potters are seen as a group as uh, having been, you know, women who stayed back. If you're in a hunting gathering society, the women are staying by the hearth, they're caring for children. And so maybe they're the ones who have the time and, you know, energy to be producing pottery. Um, and maybe that's where that explanation came from um, while the men were out, you know, shooting animals or whatever. But um, again, very difficult. There's no one to tell us. <laughs> and do we know, we've had this question a couple times, do we know the presumed function of the smaller jars uh, mm -hmm. at the top portion of that larger jar? And um, do we, maybe do we know what the significance of the protruding animal heads may have been? Um, I can't say what the, the smaller jars were for. The animal heads, you know, like the uh, animal Im imagery, Im imagery that sometimes appears on dotaku and the decoration of dotaku uh, ceremonial um, bronzes, bronze bell-shaped uh, ritual vessels. They, you know, if there's some, connection to this agricultural society for sure and maybe to some kind of religious or you know spiritual beliefs of the society at that time um, but the specific meaning of that kind of imagery is also unknown i'm sorry these are unsatisfying answers it, it, now you're getting a you can get a sense of uh, how you know um it's difficult to piece together a picture of the past. And actually, I can tell you one interesting story that, um, you know, from much, much later records, we do know that in during the Heian period, which is much later on, you know, that's um, the, the, the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries, there is, a, there is a, a written source that tells us that someone rode by an old tomb um, and um, it was, I guess, at night, and um, one of the horse honeywa on top of the tomb came to life and started galloping along beside him. So, you know, from those kind of stories that are circulated, you know, maybe centuries after the tombs were built, you can get the sense that people might have looked at the honeywa and understood them as, um, you know, inhabited by spirits and uh, able to come to life in that way, um, which is kind of an interesting perspective on them. But again, it's a much later source and we don't have anybody writing at the time to tell us what they meant. I think it's fascinating, even just that we, we don't, may not know the answers and we may never know the answers. I think that's such a fascinating part of the historical story is that we just have these objects and that there are some things that we will never know. And I personally think it's fascinating to know what we might be able to know and just things that we just don't know. I, I love that aspect of like object collection and historical significance of things. It's definitely, such an amazing part of uh, find, to finding out or not finding out <laughs> what we get to know and what we don't know. And it looks like we have just a bit of time for a couple more questions. And um, are the, let's see, oh, this is a good one. Um, are, the, are those bells found um, in certain mountainous regions, the ones that were buried, are they specific to any regions or are they found all over? Mm. Well, um, they've been found in the central part of the main island, Honshu, um, and then um, uh, in the earlier period, and then extending all the way down to Hiroshima in the, at the southwest end of Honshu, as it were, and then um, up to the east as far as Shizuoka. So they're distributed in a pretty wide band uh, in the main island. They're, usually found in on hillsides away from the settlements. So, you know, it's it's pretty clear that they had some 
special ritual significance. And I think a lot of people firmly believe they were used in rituals tied to agriculture. Um, and they were buried in a way that indicates that they had extreme importance to the people who owned them um, and were you know, high status objects and treated um, you know, as, um, as things with a great safe, sacred meaning. And I think we, this is gonna be our last question because uh, we're almost out of time. Um, sort of as a wrap up, uh, have the, these early ceramics, uh, maybe in your opinion, influence contemporary vessels because they, they look so similar to modern uh, pieces that we see in our everyday lives. And so can you talk a little bit about how they it maybe influence what we see today? Hmm. Yeah, it's it, well. It's actually interesting. I think you know, uh, in the post World War II period, a lot of people in Japan and in the West were looking back to these ancient ceramics, the Jomon and Yayoi ceramics, and kind of recognized in them qualities that um, you know sort of were in sync with a modernist point of view and, and really started to appreciate these very ancient objects and were inspired by them. There are a number of potters who, you know, do interesting contemporary takes on um, particularly Jolong ceramics. I think they've inspired a number of potters. But, you know, the, the um, pottery making techniques, you know, many of them are the same. They haven't changed. There's still pots that are made with coils and slabs of clay and, um, you know, decorated with, if you look at a manual of Japanese pottery making today, you see, you know, uh, patterns made by patting the surface or using a rope and, you know, applying, applicating coils of clay and uh, incising surfaces and the, you know, the, the, the appreciation for the clay body, the beauty of the natural clay body without glaze, I think is something that has kind of remained a constant over the centuries and is very much, has very much affected potters today. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of potters have looked back at these ceramics and appreciated them. They're sure. definitely, that was definitely very interesting. I think that was our last question. Um, so I want to thank you for taking the time, Laura, to uh, take these questions. I want to thank everyone who submitted them. Um, it was definitely a lot of fun to be able to read these and talk with Laura about these. Uh, and I want to thank Nicole and Ted, who were our technical um, support during this webinar. And thank you again to Laura for being here. It was definitely so much fun. And we appreciate you guys uh, participating in these events. And we definitely encourage you to come to the museum if you can to see these pieces in person. They're gorgeous, they're wonderful, they're so well displayed and they're such an exciting part of our collection. And if you don't have the opportunity to come to the museum, we have a lot of virtual programming coming up. And if you're interested in learning more events like this, our next Art Escapes is going to be with Dr. Robert Mintz and it's the subject is tiny things, which should be a lot of fun. And that is on May 8th. So we, again, thank you to everyone who participated. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, everyone who made this possible. And most importantly, thank you to our viewers. Thank you for submitting questions. This was definitely a great time. Thank you so much. And I hope you guys can come to the museum or we'll see you again on our next Art Escapes.